<clears throat> All right, I hope, I hope that our, the, my goal for today is that we would be able to see 12 and 13, these really important topics here, as the natural conclusion and sort of the climax to what we've done in 1 to 11. So often um, 1 to 8 is, is considered separate or 9 to 11 is considered separate, but I hope that you see this as a symphony that just keeps building and building and building, and, and it's not like it's over now, because if you're, just, if you're just a theological nerd and you just love theology, you might think it's over now. But it's not. All of that theology is in service to get us here to chapter 12. And, and in fact, even 12 to 16 is kind of, of a crescendo. Because 12 is going to start out very general, and then the 13 is going to get more specific, and then 14 and 15, he's going to get more specific. And so I think if we were watching Paul uh, deliver this sermon, if we can call it that, he would get more and more excited, and he'd still be getting more excited, all the way to 14 and 15, where he was really... Well, kind of like Sean was this morning, you know, just just shouting louder and getting noisier and in it, all, in, all in a great way, all in a good way, um, because the, the climaxes were really moving to it, and, and I want you to see this as part of that and, and see it as a natural flow to it, rather than simply 1 to 11, theology, 12 to 16, application, right? That, that's, not, um, that's not a good way to divide those up, all right? So in, in 12... Uh, Chapter 12, we start out here with these really, really famous verses. How many people, I won't ask you to prove it, but how many people have memorized these in the past? Romans 12, 1 and 2. Yeah, that's pretty, I mean, it's, it's a pretty popular one to memorize, and it's a good one to memorize, too. And it's good even if you take it out of context, it's still good. If you put it in context, it's even better, <laughs> <laughs> which is what we want to try to do now, okay? So as you take a look at this, we start out with, I present you, therefore, brothers, and by the mercies of God, Present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive and holy. A little bit different than probably the translation you memorized it in. I would memorize it as living sacrifices. Okay, um, And um, I, I'm not trying to be picky about this, but I just said, you know, just for the sake of contrast here, Paul could have really talked about offering real animal sacrifices because he, you know, he does six weeks after this. But, of course, he didn't, and why not? So just so we don't take it for granted... Why does Paul speak um, so metaphorically here? And again, if, you, if, if your answer should include chapters 1 to 11 in some sense. I hope that makes sense. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be a very difficult answer. I just want you to think through. Anybody want to take a shot at it for me? Yeah, Bree? Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, really, uh, really good start, really good start. That is absolutely what he's trying to do. He's trying to take it off of simply the law or the things which you would do in the outward way. He's really talking about the inward heart. That's absolutely true. And keep, can you keep going? Can anybody stay where, where she is and keep going? And what are some more implications of this that arise out of that? Mm-hmm. That's um, so yeah, like she was saying, the heart and he wants to he wants to change our hearts and that is a living sacrifice we will um, obey him and that will be our worship. Okay, good point, Matt. Um th- th- those things are all true and I don't want to neglect those that you have to keep those. But let's just go six weeks from now. Paul's gonna be there and uh, if he closes out a Nazarite vow or if he helps those other people out, do you think he'll just be going through the motions or do you think he will do it from his own heart? So you, you don't want to just, just contrast those because you can do those things from the heart. <coughs> Luke? Exactly. I, I think that's where we're going. He wants us to do these things from the heart, but he's also saying, you know what? Uh, when I go back in six weeks, uh, I'll be able to do these things, but my friend Trophimus won't be able to. Now, do you know who Trophimus is? It's kind of an important word. Andrea, can you help us out? Mm-hmm. 
exactly. In, in Acts 22, it says the Jews, or 21 or 22, it says they thought that Paul had taken Trophimus, a Greek, into the temple area, and so that's why they tried to kill him. Right? This is such a really fantastic, fantastically important and violent and zealous situation. Right? So he's speaking in a way here that is going to speak to all of his audience. Right? The Jews and the Gentiles there, and so everybody can offer their lives a living sacrifice. Okay? So it is true, like I said, Romans 12, 1 and 2 is, is true if you take it out of context, put it in context, it means even more. And I think that's part of where he's going here. So let, let me show you this picture up here. Um, I put this up here just to make Parker and Steve happy. Anybody else been to Israel besides th those two? Andrea, when did you go? Uh, high school junior year. Oh, okay. How long? How long? It's a long time ago, but how many, not that, 10 days. 10 days, okay, well that's cool. Well, you recognize this picture, I'm sure, okay. So, um, what I want to show you is, is this. Let me just darken it up just for fun. You guys won't, won't start kissing each other, do anything bad if I turn the lights off, will you? Watch, look out for the engaged couple over there, watch that and make sure. Um, you can see a little bit better here. Th this is a picture of, uh, of the temple that Jesus would have gone to. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, and, be, and you can, uh, this whole structure is what Herod built. Herod was an incredible builder. And uh, when Jesus says, tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it again in three days, and they said, we've been working on this for 46 years and we're not, not done with it yet, this is what they were referring to. And this is a huge, huge, huge complex. All this stuff in here is like 17 football fields big. And you can't even see it very well. That's why I darkened it up. I mean, I darkened the room up. But these are not little ants. These are people here. And even though that looks like a, uh, a house with, with a proportionate sized doorway in it, uh, that is a huge doorway. This is a huge doorway here. It's not like a person would exhaust that by any means. This is a uh, um, the scale of it is hard to catch. So I just want to show you a little bit more of it. This is a, uh, you can't actually see it, but up here on this corner is what I'm going to show you next. And it's, it looks very similar to this. And it shows you a little bit more of the scale of, of how grand this thing was. See the people coming up the staircase. And because it's on a mountaintop, here it actually builds these retaining walls and then, then backfills it, makes this big flat area. Here's the temple proper itself. Uh, this is uh, where the money changers would be because you had to exchange money and sell the goats and Jesus, you know, uh, kicks them out of there. But, but here's what that looks like. And so, so this part right here is expanded over here and uh, then a picture from inside looks like this. So you get this, this incredibly majestic feel as you walk into it. Now it's supposed to do that. The reason why God designed the temple the way he did was he wanted you to feel a certain... Uh, smallness when you went in to give you a sense of the majesty and the power of God. And we all know, like even just from chapel today, it takes work to get that into your head. You know, a lot of people worked really, really hard through testimonies and the song and everything to kind of magnify the name of God. To, and, and that's part of what the architecture is trying to do here as well. So it's a really, really big area. And this is really kind of silly. But whenever I see these places, this is a, a hotel we went to. Have you ever been to one of these hotels? Uh, and I and I just um, took pictures of it just because it just and you the pictures really don't even do it justice. Um, so that's what it would have been like to have been in this temple. Now the reason why actually where I'm going now is this: um, that little spot right there is actually called the court of the men. This is only men can go in there. This is called the court of the women. Only only Jewish women. Can go in there. I think men can go in there too, but the women can. If you're not a, not a Jewish woman, you can't go in there. But uh, out here, this is called the court of the Gentiles. That's as far as Gentiles could go. And and actually, what is in between? Isn't that cool? The way the Gentiles looks like it's just sitting right there on top of it. Come on, you're impressed, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, what's in between is this little barrier here, and I know you can't read it from where you are. But this it says here in the script, a latticed or screened railing prohibiting Gentiles or, or non-purified Jews from entering the temple courts. Um, and what is actually on that um, uh, is this. 
Th this large separated area was referred to as the court of the Gentiles out, out here. Um, Non-Jews from any race or religion were permitted to enter this great open courtyard of the temple area. They could walk within it, but they were forbidden to go any further than the outer court. They were excluded from entering into any of the inner courts, and warning signs in Greek and Latin were placed, giving strict warning that the penalty for such trespass was death. The Romans actually permitted the Jewish authorities to carry out the death penalty for this offense, even if the offender were a Roman citizen. Now, this is exactly where Paul gets in trouble, because they said he brought Trophimus inside there. Now, he didn't do that, but you can see why they were uh, kind of on shaky ground here. He's a Roman citizen, so we're going to kill him. Well, actually, if he were, if Paul were Greek uh, and not Jewish, that would have worked. Or if Trophimus had actually gone in there, it would have worked. But, the, you know, th these are the laws of the time. The engraved block of limestone was discovered um, in Jerusalem in 1871. Its dimensions are about 22 inches high. Each letter was nearly one and a half inches high and originally painted with red ink against the white limestone. And this is the block it's talking about. Okay, this was all over that little that little wall. No foreigners to go beyond the balustrade and the plaza of the temple zone. Whoever is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. Right. So yeah, they're not, they're not kidding around here. This is, this is pretty serious uh, security violation. And if you, go, if you go back, let me go back here. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can actually. Uh, it was one of, these, one of these places where it said that that wall may be what Paul was referring to right here in Ephesians chapter 2, and I think that's probably true. Remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, um, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants, the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier. So that, that kind of vivid picture in people's minds is probably what Paul is talking about here. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law and the things, the law keeping the two people separate, with his commands and regulations, his purpose to, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So um, I, I think it's interesting, even though this system is still working there in, in Jerusalem, Paul sees the day perhaps when it will go away and certainly sees the day when the Gentile doesn't even have to go in to offer those sacrifices because, as we said before, uh, he actually is a temple, right? If the Holy Spirit is in you, you are a temple. So there's no need to go in there and do that sort of thing. And in Christ, all of these people are, are, are clearly one. So we get back then um, to this. <clears throat> to Romans chapter 12. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Again, this is something that both Jew and Gentile can do, right? Um, Pleasing to God, which is your only kind of reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is the good and well-pleasing uh, and perfect. Now, uh, obviously you don't want to be conformed. Uh, you want to be transformed by your mind. You want to think differently. But that leads us to question number two. Uh, given the whole context of the epistle, in what way exactly does Paul expect these people to not be conformed to the world. So you read my stuff. Boys shouldn't have long hair and girls shouldn't have short skirts. Anybody else have any funny stories to tell? You know nobody wants to tell your stories. <clears throat> Did anybody grow up in really, really, really strict backgrounds and you, you were worried about becoming conformed to the world? Parker? In what ways did they not want you to conform to the world? I told them, I told them to be in a Hebrew school and I wrote a Hebrew book. Yeah. You sinner, you didn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I didn't think we did bus ministry since the 70s. I didn't think anybody did bus ministry since the 70s. Really? Where, where, what, about where was the, what, what, what state was this in? In Ohio. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's good. Can anybody else identify with these things? Have you heard these things? Have you have you lived in a place like that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steve. And you said, Yeah, gosh, she could have been exposed to something like today if she'd come here. That would be bad, yeah. Ben, huh? oh, did you were you gonna say? Did you have a hand yeah, up? No, okay. Uh, I, I grew up for a few years uh, after we got saved. I lived on a farm, a vegetable farm with my family, with no television, door to button down the street. Uh, my sisters and mother made most of their own clothes. I was an altar boy. Uh, we had little to no contact with the outside world. Uh, and then you went apostate. What? Then you went apostate yeah, yeah, then we, and started wearing we soccer shirts. That's, that's the way it always starts. <laughs> okay, all right. So if, if this is, and I, uh, some of you are looking like amazed, you've never heard this stuff before, but, but other people, it's been a big part of where, where a lot of us grew up, right? And, and uh, even in defense of that, even in defense of that, an awful lot of people, you know, all of our motives are very mixed. Remember last time we talked about Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? It's always true when you're, when you're thinking about these things. There's an awful lot of people who have very, very good motives and really, really trying to honor God by separating themselves from, uh, from the world, right? So don't be conformed to the world. But if, let's just say for the sake of argument, if that's not it, if it's not just that we're trying to avoid clothing styles or hairstyles or other styles, then, then what actually is it that Paul's getting at when he says don't be conformed? And particularly given the context of this book. So I'm just kind of asking you, how did you answer question number two? Daniel? Uh huh. That's right. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, th that's really good. That's really, really, really good. Um, ha d now, how did you come up with that? Did you hear me say it five times throughout the semester? Yes. Okay, okay. I, I didn't, I didn't know because I don't know if you guys are listening or not. I know you're always listening, but I don't know if you, you know, things stick or if they don't stick. But I, I really do think that uh, we memorize these and don't ever think about this but that this is actually the answer to 12, 1, and 2. Now, we don't do that because that seems so anticlimactic. 
for the grace given to me, I say to you, every one of you must not think of himself more highly than you ought to think. Okay, okay, we won't, we won't do that. But that's not a big deal, is it? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Do you realize, uh, the more we go through this, I think the easier we'll be see, you will be to see. But I think this, if anything, is the point at which he's been driving at the entire book. As Daniel said, God is putting the world back together. And in putting the world back together, the way we treat each other is incredibly important. How did the whole thing fall apart in the first place? Adam and Eve started disobeying God and treating each other badly, right? And, and look what Cain and Abel did, right? And so in putting the world back together, this is a major, major, major first step. Now, obviously, it takes the Calvary, it takes regeneration, it takes the work of the Spirit. All of that theology is supporting this. And what is it going to get to? That you treat each other kindly with humility and not think of yourself more highly than you want to. Ryan, did you want to say something else to this? You had your hand up back there, didn't you? I'm sorry. Did somebody else say Dolly? You mean people that are more uh, sensitive to the community spirit? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still missing your question. The question is, do you think this is like, that the message of Paul is saying is uh, like treating each other well is probably going to be harder for us to do in that regard? Yeah, I, 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 I was, couldn't quite figure out the, where you were going with that because I think those people would be much more convicting. Because if the community wasn't working together, they would surely know about that and be aware of it and think, oh my gosh, yeah, we really are out of bounds, aren't we? Right? And, I, and you're right, I think it's kind of lost on the individuals when we think, okay, well, you know, if I have a chance to be nice to my neighbor or not be thinking of myself as, as, as better, then, then maybe I won't do that. But you're not involved in a community in the West like people are in the rest of the world. Okay. So let me, let me say it like this. Uh, I think a major culmination of the book is 12.3, not thinking more highly than others, as we have uh, seen throughout the book. Chapter 2, Jews looking down on Gentiles because they were sinners. Chapter 11, Gentiles looking down on Jews because they were broken off. Right? And, and if you started, if you actually went back through the book of Romans and thought about it from this perspective, you would start to see this popping out in every chapter. In every chapter, you would see Paul pushing the pride down on both sides. Treat each other in love and humility and stop competing over your perceived worth, which is how the world thinks. The gospel, chapters 1 to 11, is God fixing his creation, and this is what it looks like in the church. And, and I think this doesn't seem very important to us because we, we tend to think that um, other issues are, are sexier or more important. But this idea of relating to each other in a humble sort of a way so that you really can have unity in the body is, 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 is the start of everything that, uh, that's going to be good from here on out. Now... Um, you'll notice that as you, as you read here, verse 3, it says this, By the grace of God uh, given to me, I say to you, to every one of you, not to think of more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think with sober discernment as God has distributed to each of you a measure of faith for just as in one body. And so what he's, what he's going to get to, if I can just summarize verse 3, it's this. D don't think you're something special because of you know, who you are or what you've got. You should think in terms of your gifting, how can I benefit the body? Not how does it separate me, not how does it make me better, not does it how, how does it make me more important, but rather simply ask yourself, in what way can I serve this kingdom team and make the entire team better? And so I think he's just totally flipping it on his head, right? Because most people, we look and say, okay, what talents and abilities do I have that can make me special, that can make me money, that can make me prestige, that can make me fame? That's how the world thinks. What are my advantages? What are my abilities? What, is, what do I look like? How can I leverage my assets to gain power? And Paul says, no, 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 no. Whatever good things you've been given, whether it's your GPA or your looks or your talents or your body or whatever, think about how you can use that to serve the team. 
for just as in one body we have many members and not all members serve the same function, then we go on here to the whole discussion of spiritual gifts, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll pull this together again after we do a gift, but let's get on to the gift part. Tim, did you want to say something? Okay. Nope? Okay. All right. Be careful if you don't raise your hand today. I might just call on you, all right? So let's get on then to number three, spiritual gifts. Now, did this, this uh, weird you out as you went through the questions here? Okay. I've talked to several people who said, I had no clue what was going on. I was really worried about the answers. And I read through their answers, and they got exactly what I wanted them to get. So maybe you were weirded out, but maybe you actually came to where I wanted you to come. Right? So just for fun here, letter A, uh, how many people circled no? Okay, all right, that's cool. Uh, does it bother you if you answered no to the question above? Did it? Mm -hmm, a little bit. Are you now worried if you answered yes? What did you push it that one? Okay. Do you think you have one of the gifts listed in these verses? If you answered yes, did this happen to you just after your salvation? So talk to me. Let, uh, let's hear some answers for letter D. Did anybody, can anybody think through this? Now for me, I don't know, if you were like me, I always say, I think I told you this before, my, sometimes my testimony was... Uh, I was a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner, and, and before I got saved, I drifted from sandbox to sandbox. Right? I got saved when I was six years old. So a lot of you are like that. You think, okay, the before me and the after me, I don't know, how bad can you be at five? <laughs> you know, And you sometimes get jealous of the people who get saved later in life because they have this dramatic before and after choice. Right? Um, and and you know, when it comes time to give a testimony, it's like, okay, I, I, haven't, I haven't got much to say. <laughs> you know? Ryan? Okay? Now, I don't disagree with what you said. I actually kind of like what you said. <coughs> On the other hand, I think that's contrary to a lot of the way spiritual gift teaching goes. Okay, can I just say it that way? An awful lot of spiritual gift teaching goes something like, the moment you got saved, the, the Holy Spirit gave you a special talent that you didn't have before. The, there's grown up a whole theology of spiritual giftedness in the church in some circles, it's been a, a real prominent thing. Some circles, it hasn't. So it might be like the legalism thing we talked about before. You might be coming out of a church where this is a big deal, or you might be coming out of a church where you've never heard of it before, and you're saying, well, what's, what's going on? Well, uh, this is just for the benefit of people who have, have been um, pressured to know what special, unique gift you got at salvation and then to use it. Right? So I'm really going here into kind of talking about a little the a theology of gifts, and that's why I thought I would have fun with it and say, at letter F, is the gift of celibacy one of them? Because nobody wants to think that is a spiritual gift, certainly not a prized one, right? Oh, my goodness, I sure hope not. I hope I don't have that gift. And yet, Paul uses the same terminology for that. But we don't want to include that in the gifts. Although Luke is worried that he has No, he's not really worried that he has <clears throat> Does anyone have the gift of music or technology? How did you answer that one? I just think that there was one emphasis that uh huh. Okay. And so, how do we make that distinction? Because now you're saying, what? Well, what is the definition of gift? Okay, it becomes a gift if you start using it for spiritual purposes, right? In which case it becomes a spiritual kind of gift. Rather than one which you necessarily got dispensed to you at the moment of salvation. So maybe the word spiritual here is not so much talking about the source of it as it is the use of it. So could you indeed have a spiritual gift of computer technology? or a gift of music, which you could use in spiritual ways. And of course, what I'm suggesting here, I think that is the case, that by the way you take a look at the words, the, 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 the lists which Paul gives, and I'll show you why in a second, that it, it, could be understood, it could be understood that way. 
letter H, do you think this list in Romans 12 is exhausted? That is, are all the gifts of God necessarily listed here or any of the two passages? And once you start to ask that question, that kind of really breaks it open. Are those exhaustive? Are those the only gifts which there are? If they are, how come he lists slightly different ones in Ephesians 4 than he does in 1 Corinthians? And then how in the world would the Romans ever put that together? So, uh, you know, I wrote this letter to Corinth, and you're going to have to get that one and add it to the one from Romans. And oh, by the way, I'm going to write another one seven years from now, or five years from now, and you're going to have to get that one together to put all these gifts together. Does that really make sense? I, 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 don't, I don't think so. So what does it mean for the theology of gifts? Well, let, let me put it like this, okay? Here's some summary thoughts for me. Um, and I, I hope this will, will ease some of the burden and make sense to you. I don't think these lists are exhaustive, and thus there may be many, many more that the Bible doesn't identify. So if you're trying to say, which one of these seven things am I good at? I'm not good at any of them. Or the default one, you send... I'm, I'm, I'm not good at teaching, so I must, I must be good at service or something like that. You know, we all kind of default to that because everybody can serve. Number two, I personally doubt that each person has just one. Now, that might seem really strange, but in these theologies and spiritual gifts, a lot of people go to 1 Peter 4.10 and say, as everyone has received the gift. I think it's actually talking about the gift of salvation, but <clears throat> that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the teachings. Everybody has one gift, and you have to find out what it was. I don't think that's true. And then let me say this, the distinction between spiritual and natural abilities seems a little bit artificial, especially now that the first century miraculous foundational gifts have ceased. And here's what I'm talking about. And, and, and we, we even talked about this a little bit, several of you mentioned it. Is it ability or is it spiritual? I think that's a false distinction, and here's why. Let me show you 1 Corinthians 4, right? That's, that's the reference of there, 1 Corinthians 4. This, then, is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now, it's required that those who've been given a trust, whatever that trust is, must prove faithful. Right? Think of been given a gift, been given an ability. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any other human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He'll bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of saying, don't go beyond what is written. Then you'll not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us or over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Do you understand what Paul is getting at here? He's talking about the differences in the abilities between Apollos and himself, and he says, what do you have that you didn't receive? And, of course, what he's trying to say is God gave everything we have to us. So this is, this is why this distinction between, okay, I have this spiritual gift, but this is my natural talent. What I'm, what I'm trying to argue against is to say it is my natural talent. That GPA that you have is not yours. Right? The looks you have are not yours. The body you have is not yours. God made everything. He gifted you with every gift and ability and talent that you have. None of it belongs to you. Every bit of it, God gave to you for a purpose. And you are responsible to use whatever that is or whatever unique combination that is for him. So when I, and I think about various people, even in this classroom, and I've Try not to embarrass you here. But many of you have amazing talents and gifts that you bless us with even this morning that are they're in some ways not listed, but you used for great spiritual purposes. Right? And, and I think, um, you know, when I, when I was in college, the, the, the teachers were the ones that affected us most, and so we all wanted to have the gift of teaching. Right? But there are all sorts of different... Um, ways that that gift gets manifested or the ability to teach get manifested. And you, and, and you here have had some really, really, really good teachers. I could list a lot of my colleagues which are just dear as can be to me and which I sit under their teaching ministries. I love to go hear Dr. Cowser and Dr. Williams teach about New Testament. Uh, Dr. Estes teach wisdom and so many others teach in, in their areas. And part of what I love about all of those people is they don't try to be somebody else. They just try to be themselves. Right? They just try to be who they are 
and, and let the way God has taught them um, you, you work through their personalities. And th those are un you, you know, they're unique gifts, and, and they just use whatever God has given to them. Um, so the, the gift of music or the gift of technology, how do you use those things to, to further the kingdom? And I think it's, it probably behooves us a, uh, to, to think, to worry a lot less about which specific one of those seven gifts you have and to say, here's how I'm made. How can I use this to fit it into a niche? Right? So let's not worry about the individual gift. Let's, let's worry about this. Bottom line, use whatever you have to make this kingdom team better and don't worry about what recognition you may or may not receive. And most important of all, don't think more highly of yourself just because you're gifting. Right? I th really think that's where Paul's going with this whole thing. He actually isn't trying to teach about spiritual gifts per se. They're just part of the illustration to say, okay, whatever distinctions you have, use them for the body. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but think about how you can use this uniqueness to serve the body because God's putting this, this kingdom team back together. And I, th I think that's kind of the answer to... <clears throat> to um, well, kind of the answer to number letter I and letter J, okay? <clears throat> so I would say a possible definition of a spiritual gift. Any talent or gift that God might use for his spiritual purposes. And I'm pretty sure that will work wherever you go to in the New Testament to, 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 to think through. Right? Um, anybody want to argue against it or question or add to it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's both. And, and Jews would cer have certain uh, privileges given to them too, or, or Gentiles might as well. And yeah, a absolutely. Yeah. So are you really, really smart? Well, you're simply accountable by God for, from God to use that for his glory. <clears throat> are you talented in music? You're obligated by God to use that for his glory. Dahlia? Yeah, um, I'm, so, I'm no, what are you talking about? Well, yes. I would say it's a, it's a, a, a gift is, <clears throat> that he or she is using to bless the church. Can you give me an example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you can, you, yes, yes, you can, you can think about it from both perspectives because you can think about <clears throat> Judas getting up and preaching and people getting saved from it and Judas having really selfish motives and yet God overruling and working through that. <clears throat> In the very same way, Balaam has selfish motives, but God works through that to bless people. God uses it for spiritual purposes, even though the person may not have intended it that way. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, I think those are those are good examples too. Okay. Yeah, Tim. I have a follow-up. Yes. Um, where do you get the now that the first century miraculous gifts have ceased? Uh, and and this is, uh, I'm just gonna say, no. the majority world church, I have a feeling would have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> no, you don't have to go any further. I totally agree. I know where I see where you're going. I agree with you. I was speaking broadly and generally here. Okay. I, d I do believe that, that there are miraculous things going on in various places that I've, I've heard firsthand from the people who experienced them about. Yeah. I'm totally, totally with you. I, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying generally, uh, uh, no, no, right. no apostles today. Right, I yeah. agree. Um, where, where do you think people get that kind of a statement, though? You mean that kind of s strong cessationist yes. statement? Yes. Uh, because they'd never go to the majority world. <laughs> From a purely academic standpoint, 
purely academic ivory tower, intellectual Western society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People who have never. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever had a chance to uh, to go overseas or to be with people in the churches that are in the cutting edge of places. Uh, but I hope you get a chance to do that. I hope you get a chance to hear them and talk to them. And uh, if you're not going to be gone right after graduation on Sunday, you can hear Isaac Shaw speak at Grace, who's the father of Miriam and Gloria Shaw, if you know them. And he can tell you stories that will make your hair curl about the goodness of God and the power of God and the amazing ways God does miracles uh, on cutting edge places that, and doesn't ask us permission to do it. Yes. Uh huh. Right. Well, uh, yeah, uh, for spiritual purposes, to to have unbelievers come to him. <coughs> No, I, you, you make an excellent point. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you just broaden it out a little bit, it, the same thing is true with every choice, every decision you get to make. Because one day we're making decisions that bring glory to God. Another day we're making decisions that don't bring glory to God. And, and, and believe, uh, you know, everybody has that option to do that. So in some way, um, I, you know, I still stick by the definition. It's just that you have a chance to use you have a chance to use the things which God has given you for him or for yourself. Just think of Samson. I mean, that's the whole point of Samson. He did that stuff by the Spirit, which, which really, really makes you squeamish when you think, how could the Spirit help him tear the gate out? But the Bible clearly says it did. And I think that's the scary part, that, that the Spirit just makes it very, very clear um, that, but we can do this very, very similar thing. I'm, I'm using the talents, the abilities, the, the body which God gave me for good things or for bad things. And that is a scary thought because it, 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 just, it talks about how important our choices are every day, that God's going to let you use it for good or for real. Well, you you can you can use you can use your abilities for good or for ill. You can use the things which the Spirit gives you or which God gives you for good spiritual purposes or bad fleshly purposes. See. I know, I know. I, 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 I was wandering around looking for my clicker, but I was totally listening to what you were saying. And I do think, I think you're right, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 4. That's why this hits me so hard. Who makes you different? What do you have that you did not receive? Well, gosh, that just includes everything, right? And he's clearly talking here. I mean, he's talking about Apollos himself. Steve? Right, right. I really form a good hand back here, but even these kind of like undisputable spiritual gifts of this, we can be used for good or ill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good point.
You want it to be neat and clean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what verse did you say to talk about, Steve? 12? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, good. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a better way to say it than I did. Yeah, that's good. I like that. And and the, and the fallacy would be to think those are the only ways you can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. Okay. Yeah, Kay. Yeah, that's a, that, you, you know what, Katie, I had the same question. It does seem like, it, it does say according to the measure, right? And so um, it makes it look as though you're going to be able to exercise these gifts with even greater power dependent upon your commitment to him. But even there, he talks about it as though he's given it to us instead of somebody we exercise. But that, that's, not un, that's not atypical for Paul. You know, when we saw in Galatians, now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, you know. So I put my faith in him, and yet Ephesians 2 says faith is something he also gives to us. So it's that wonderful mystery of we're responsible to exercise it, but realizing even when we do that God is the one who enables it in the first place. And I do think that you're going to be able to exercise all these things greater the closer you walk with him and the more faith you have in him. And as Paul says, that the, the more faith he's given to us. It is kind of a mystery, and I don't fully understand it either. Well, sh uh, we better we better keep going. Seth, you want to say something else? I think that's something which is super, often those, the charismatic gifts are often the ones that are the supernatural ones, the ones that we don't see in the general population, right, the gift of healing. I think those are ones that are um, definitively used, given by God for certain situations, but uh, it's, uh, it's in addition to these kinds of things which we do see in the general population. But he calls these spiritual too, right? So... All right, let's, let's go to number four. Now, I don't know if you saw number four as a very important question or not, or if you thought about it deeply. But what happens if you do verses 9, 9 to, what did I say, 20 to the end of the chapter? So what happens if you follow the commands of 12, 9 to 21? Yeah, absolutely. Did you catch that? I mean, uh, just let that sink in just a little bit deeply. If you really do those things, the unity in the church incredibly grows. 
would you like to be a part of a group of people who did this all the time? Are you kidding? That's like heaven on earth. I mean, <clears throat> our worship today was a little bit of heaven on earth. But to come out of our 10 o'clock hour and then to work with a group of people, with a team of people that are going to live like this all the time, love is going to be without hypocrisy. Just, I mean, it would take us hours to go through that whole list. But just, just stop with that one. Let your love be without hypocrisy. So that I knew that if you were nice to me, you didn't want something from me. If I was nice to you, you knew I didn't want something from you. I just loved you because of the goodness of God that, that goes outward without wanting anything in return. What if, what if all of a sudden that's the only, what if all of a sudden here in this, in this group, all of us could do that with each other all the time? Just think how that would transform us. And you would never have to wonder, is he trying to get something? Is she trying to get something? What's going on there? I mean, this would just be heaven on earth. I mean, it really, really would. And um, I really hope that when we go through this, you, you don't just look at that sort of stuff as, okay, that's sort of the optional fluff, but that's not the hard theology. Because <clears throat> I sit here speaking to you today as an old man. And I say that, not, not, not being facetious here, I, I, I say that because looking back over my life, I've lived through a lot of stuff. I lived through a lot of stuff right here at Cedarville. The first, I've been here for 25 years. The first 10 years I came were glorious. I came and Cedarville was everything it was uh, advertised to be and I just had a ball living with people and working with people who were on the same team and, and things were really, really great. And then, and then, some trouble started. I don't know if the devil just was not happy with uh, such a good situation. And trouble started, even in our Bible department. And things got out of hand, and people got mad at each other. And people sued each other. And I got sued because I wrote a note that said, in the Bible department, we haven't handled our problems well, and, and we have not loved each other well, and we have been sinful. And because of those statements, I got sued for two years. Eventually, it fell apart because it was a baseless accusation. But it sure doesn't help you sleep very well at night when that kind of thing happens. And a bunch of people got fired. Administration got fired a bunch of people and kicked them out. And then a whole other group of people came in. And there were some tensions in there. And then administration came in and kicked a whole bunch of other people out. So when you take a look at our roster of people in our Bible department, we've got an Estes for 30 years and a Miller for 25 and a Kowser for 22 and you know a couple people who have been here for a long time, but not very many beyond that, a Hutch and a Dixon. You know. And I look at that, and I'm not here to say who was right or who was wrong, but I sit here as, as an older man, and I grieve, I absolutely grieve over the inability of leaders in the Bible department not being able to get along. It's just very, very, very grieving to me and <sighs> d discouraging because there has to be a way to, to have good theology and believe in theology and teach theology and love it and stand for it and yet also live like this. We just and those things are really often hard to put together. But if you're not living like this, you're not really living from the theology. And I just want to say to you that none, nothing else matters if we don't genuinely get along. Now, I'm not asking. I'm not asking for people just to be nice and ignore issues. What I'm asking for is for love to be without hypocrisy to abhor what is evil, to cling to what is good, to be devoted to one another with mutual love, showing eagerness and honor in one another, because this is indeed the climax of the book. This is how God is putting the world back together. And if, and if we just focus on the doctrine, but we don't live this way, we haven't accomplished anything. And to follow through and to live like this makes all the difference in God's being able to fix the world through the church in the beginning, okay? So let that be my plea to you 
to to see this as the the, the most important climax of, of what we've studied so far. Um, and you can probably guess here, that's, that's part of the reason why we ended up with question number seven, which wasn't really a question, but I hope, I hope you thought about it deeply, okay? <laughs> uh, you can see some of, those, some of those issues coming out here, especially this one, right? The second, second line. Preferably, you should choose up sides between the number one and two persons and speculate about their various answers to the questions we, we'll lead them. In an extreme and worst case scenario, of course, think about reasons why your answers are better than others, and then in order to make yourselves feel more superior and spiritual, suspiciously dream up evil things about the other team and things that they've said or might have said or that you wouldn't be surprised if they said, right? Is that not human nature? Is that not the way we work? Um, and, and I really think that kind of disunity is the devil's best, best defense against the unity in the church and the rest of the world seeing that God makes a difference. So you can't neglect the teaching in 1 to 11. You can't neglect the teaching in 12 and 13 too.